Um, I'm talking this week about Mary Wollstonecraft and I just want to point out that I'm going to try to be brief here because I am requiring that you listen to at least the first 30 minutes of the BBC um, discussion of her work among scholars because it's so important. Her work is so important but also that discussion helps you see how she fits into the Enlightenment and this historical moment is well covered there. So uh, let me just get to my points that I want to emphasize. Wollstonecraft um, called herself, said she wanted to be the first of a new genus. She said, I'm going to be the first of a new genus. You know, I'm not born to tread in the beaten track. The peculiar bent of my nature pushes me on. She said that to her sister and she said it in the context of being a writer. But what we need to remember is that it's her unique combination of interests in the Enlightenment and revolutionary philosophies of her day and her interest in equality for women that I think make her a true, a truly new genus. Um, I'm not going to talk about her biography because that's both well covered in the BBC discussion and the Norton, but what I want to emphasize in terms of what's important about her biography is uh, the training she had early on to be supportive and in defense of women who suffered at the hands of men, particularly her mother who suffered at the hands of her husband or Wollstonecraft's father and her sister who was in a very bad marriage. But if you combine this protective spirit with her intellect, her refusal to submit to conventions and the gendered injustices of the time, you end up with a remarkable outspoken feminist, really the first, uh, who wrote The Vindication of the Rights of Woman. I am interested in her intellectual biography, though again I think this is touched on well in the uh, BBC discussion. But let me just say a few things. First, she was a supporter of the French Revolution. She went to France there and was there during the middle of the revolution. She was writing a secret biography of the French Revolution, though she never completed it, or history. I suppose you can't write a biography of an event. Um, she wrote The Vindication of the Rights of Man, her first pamphlet that sort of put her in the mix of the thinkers of her day in response to Edmund Burke's critique of the French Revolution. Uh, Edmund Burke had been a supporter of the American Revolution and then turned his back on the French Revolution and uh, she decried his, essentially his cowardice in that um, and entered into debate then with the, the key thinkers of her age, Thomas Paine, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, uh, William Godwin and many others. She read <clears throat> voraciously, um, she was self-taught and she argued in print with the top philosophers of her day. In fact, she translated many of the continental writers for an English, that is, you know, the European continent, for an English reading public. She taught herself to translate and she taught herself to do it very fast. So this meant she was up on the very most current ideas of her day. The Vindication of the Rights of Woman, um, of which you'll be reading selections, is her response to Jean-Jacques Rousseau's dismissal of women in his work, Emile. And she loved Rousseau for his um, social ideas and for his uh, ideas that led to the French Revolution, but she was not at all comfortable with his dismissal of women. In William Godwin, whom she ultimately married and fathered uh, a child with, that's Mary Shelley, um, she found a like-minded and compassionate companion who embraced her as a full human being, which was a rare thing at that time for women. Um, so let's think about Mary Wollstonecraft as a revolutionary, a writer who was a revolutionary. She lived in a time when, as the Norton authors point out, economic and social changes were creating a desperate need for corresponding changes in political arrangements. And like her fellow revolutionaries, her call for the rights of woman uh, was nothing less than revolutionary in the changes it would require and demand of political arrangements and social arrangements. So. Uh, she was right there in the mix um, of writers who were trying to make a difference in a very um, turbulent time. And here's what she was up against. Uh, this is a writer writing a review of Wollstonecraft in the New York Times in 2005. Here's the how things stood for women in the world Mary was born into, the England of 1759. Your property and your children were the property of your husband. Divorce was impossible, and if you dared to leave your horrid or abusive husband, you had to desert your children in the process and become an outlaw. Marital rape was perfectly legal and probably frequent. 
In all fairness, a new law in 1782 stated that a husband should not beat his wife with a stick wider than his thumb. In addition to the things that Bentley points out, women were advised by tradition, authorities, church, to make themselves sweet and appealing to men, to refrain from political talk, to demure, all of which were the things that Jean-Jacques Rousseau was upholding as the perfect woman, and why Wollstonecraft felt she had to write the Vindications of the Rights of Woman. But you still might ask, well, why are we reading her as literature? And I think there's two reasons that I want to defend here and I want to sort of shape our talking this week around. The first and most important is that she wrote powerful prose and that she was a true innovator in terms of writing. Virginia Woolf said she is alive and active. She argues and experiments. We hear her voice and trace her influence even now among the living. And I think Woolf is right. We're only only in the 20th century did we begin to really get our heads around Wollstonecraft. Um, she was dismissed by uh, the 19th century, at least in the, in the public. She was sort of underground uh, hero for a lot of writers, but publicly she was rejected. In the 20th century, we came to understand how very innovative she was. And then, this may be more of a historical reason, but her works made it possible for women writers of literature to compose. Consider her daughter Mary Shelley, but many, many others. So on that point of her style, uh, you will have noticed in the agenda this week that I'm asking you to read an essay called Chaos, Hyperbole, and Repetition, Style as Political and Social Critique in Vindication of the Rights of Woman. The point of that essay, and the reason I'm having you read it, is that it's an excellent close reading of um, Wollstonecraft's style to make the argument that in order for her to make her social and political critique, she had to create a new style. And so Gibbles points out, instead of direct confrontation, Wollstonecraft had to, often has vague references to persons, changes in register, alternating speaking positions for, for herself, thematic switches, and so on. These strategies do not merely make the text alive, but are inherent to her social and political critique. Um, so it's these strategies that this text does a brilliant job of pointing out. I want you to see a scholar applying close reading to make a very important argument, and it works then as a model and both, both as a model and as a uh, informative piece for you. Okay, so that's it for this week. I look forward to talking with you online and hearing what you think of the BBC discussion and also what you think of the Gibbles essay, looking carefully at Mary Wollstonecraft's prose. Bye.